just say a few words. Oh, uh, Dr. Gabriella Ibaguchi joined our department, the science department, last August. We were very, very excited to have her come on board as we're just starting to offer our, our new biology degree. So it was our first year of having students go into the, into the third year of the degree. So that's been very, very exciting. Um, she's joined the ecology team. She's a wonderful field biologist, as you're going to find out when you watch this presentation in a few minutes. And just looking at the, the picture on the screen there of that cliff face reminded me that um, I, I knew Gabriella was interested in birds before we, or when we were hiring her, but it was only when we had our science conference recently and she gave a presentation there called When Eden Froze Over, Tales of the Andean Seed Snipes, and I had no idea that this woman we had hired was so amazing in terms of her abilities in the field. You know, this is a place, or well, that's a place with a lot less oxygen in the atmosphere than here. And there was, you know, pictures of her. We got the idea of her racing up the sides of these mountains to pick up or cliffs or whatever to, to get samples from the, the eggs, etc. So I'm sure we're going to be having a super interesting presentation this evening. So join me in welcome, welcoming Gabriella as she tells us about the changing environmental impact in the Arctic, Arctic seabirds. Um, thank you, Sally. I, you made me laugh. That was a great, <laughs> great introduction. Um, so again, thank you so much for the invitation. I really, really appreciate it. And, and I, I, now that I've started to see some of the talks, I'm really enjoying them. So it's a great program you got going. So thanks. <laughs> Um, so yes, as, uh, as uh, it was hinted, I will actually take you to the Arctic for this talk. And I'm, what I'm hoping to do is just to share some of the stories of, I'm going to call it a journey. Uh, so I actually first went to the Arctic. Um, you, you might not know me very well. I'm actually from Mexico. I was born in Mexico, Mexico City of all places. And so the oxymoronic statement is, what is the Mexican in the Arctic <laughs> doing? <laughs> Um, but, you know, it really is about combining perspectives and learning from each other. And I'm going to say that we are learning so much from these birds. Uh, and uh, so I appreciate uh, your, you know, your joining us. And uh, some of the stories will be funny. Some of them will hopefully be interesting. Some of them will be a little bit sad. But I want us to walk away from this knowing that every bit of knowledge helps and we can put that to good use. So uh, here we are, uh, this island, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about it. It's called Coates Island. We are in the low Arctic here in Nunavut, Canada. And uh, the birds here uh, are thick bill murres. Uh, they are diving uh, seabirds. They can fly, but they're very good at uh, following their fish prey underwater. And um, so I'll tell you a bit more about them. And I just wanted to give you kind of one of these shots from one of my study sites. Sorry, now I'm trying to get the slide to, uh, there we go. And so I'll introduce a couple of uh, the members I will mention uh, during the talk, but first I wanted to highlight um, uh, Dr. Tony Gaston. So some of you may have heard the name or hopefully you will, uh, particularly if you're interested in birds or the Arctic or seabirds. Um, so Tony is now uh, on paper anyway, retired from Environment and Climate Change Canada, but his career spans um, at least four decades on seabirds, and he has done a lot of other uh, work in, around the world, but also other places in Canada, not just Coates Island, but also the High Arctic, Haida Wai, uh, and other places. So you'll hear his name a lot when it comes to seabird knowledge. And the other character I'm going to introduce here <laughs> is the thick bill myrrh. Uh, they are uh, in the family Alcidae. Uh, so thick bill myrrhs um, are also related to common myrrhs, which are found uh, further south but also things like razor bills, um, auklets, which are smaller, as well as things like puffins. And if you go to the Arctic, um, many languages are spoken, one of them being Inuktitut, but also dialects uh, of that. And so this is one of the names you might see for mer, Akpay or Akpait. Sometimes I've seen it as Akar. 
so as I mentioned, my story actually started as a grad student. Um, I went up to the Arctic for the first time to work on my master's project with Tony Gaston and other members I'm going to mention in a minute. And every, every graduate student needs research assistants, sometimes people who know more than we do. Uh, and so some of you are not familiar with the gentleman who was introduced earlier, Graham Gissing. So here we're taking a break. Uh, we were banding birds and this were oftentimes eight hour stretches, six hour stretches. So you need to take a coffee break and warm up your thumbs and your fingers because they won't move anymore and you get so cold. <laughs> um, but other members uh, who made a lot of this work possible, these are long-term studies actually. And we were beginning to use genetic tools uh, to study um, ecology, behavior, uh, genetic structure, how, how species form, and uh, essentially also conservation genetics. So Vicky Friesen, Tim Bird, and Peter Bogue were some of the members I, I worked with for this project. But again, a lot of these have been long-term projects since, uh, so spanning now many decades, including with Tony Gaston. So I wanted to start off uh, kind of the story, uh, I think appreciating, just uh, letting us, rem reminding ourselves so why we appreciate seabirds. So in addition to just being fascinated by them because they are pretty spectacular, they are beautiful. Sometimes we have had a complex relationship with them. Um, I do want to say thank you for, uh, for seabirds and they have certainly served as guides for a long, long time. Uh, in fact, for as long as people have been even sailing the ocean in whatever kind of vessel that was. Um, so I won't read out this whole quote, but here's an example of one. Uh, this was written by Thor Heyerdahl um, aboard the expedition of the Contiki, which was this balsa wood raft that he built with his team members to demonstrate that even pre-Inca cultures may have actually crossed over to Polynesian islands long before we thought it was possible. So he did this himself, and uh, as his crew was definitely getting probably to the end of their own rope, uh, seabirds, um, as they have done before, uh, indicated to them where land was present. So in a way, they have actually saved <laughs> many lives over millennia. And um, in some cases, um, seabirds gave up their life, uh, but it meant that others survived. And so there are many stories around the world of not just seabirds, but other birds too, where um, there were uh, unfortunate uh, accidents at sea and people ended up on land, uh, islands far away from home, and they survived because they were able to feed on seabird eggs or seabirds themselves. Uh, one of these stories involves the great auk as one example. It was a member of the fam family Alcidae. They were flightless. Uh, they were larger than the Gilmers. And many of you know that they're now extinct. And um, a couple of interesting things. They do look like penguins. In fact, uh, the, the scientific name is kind of very confusing because actually Alcids are in a completely different order of birds than penguins, uh, but ecologically they're very similar and so they have some features that are similar. And the way that the great auk would have swum underwater, uh, similar to the way that thick billmers can swim underwater and chase their fish prey is again really quite remarkable. But the penguins today give us an idea of what that may have looked like. So the great auk used to be very widespread and this is what I mean about our complex relationship with seabirds. Um, at one point, not only you know, were they present on islands where people ended up and then again, their lives were saved because they were able to feed on the seabirds, but um, they were seen as a new economy. So prior to, um, to European um, uh, fisheries and, uh, and harvesting that started around the 1500s uh, here in, in Canada and the US, uh, in the Arctic and our side of the continent here, um, there was a sustainable harvest of a lot of seabirds. There still is today. Uh, they are consumed, but it was very sustainable. And um, around the 1500s, it was really interesting to read just how um, the overexploitation of this of the species drove them to extinction. So by 1844, we lost the last great auk. And when kind of analyzing this, uh, some studies have been published, including one using actually ancient DNA and simulations. And uh, it looks like even a harvest rate of just under 11% of adults, and you add to that maybe 5% harvest rate for eggs, um, 
this would have led to the extinction of the great auk within probably 350 years, uh, based on the population sizes prior to European uh, fisheries and, uh, and kind of coming over to harvest the seabirds. And so that, I just wanted to mention that because it comes down to what species can support. And um, some of these species are amazing. So uh, the, great, the great auk and obviously thick bill murs and other species are found in these really uh, remote and harsh environments, but they're ecological trade-offs. So many of them are not laying lots of eggs. Uh, they might just lay a single egg the entire breeding season. And if that egg gets lost or depredated, that's it. They might not be able to relay another egg. Um, so these are some of the trade-offs and why not all species can handle even, even low levels of hunting and harvest. So it's good to know and to do monitoring studies to understand what populations can handle and to adjust our behavior and our policies as well. Now, many seabirds are part of environmental monitoring programs and um, and it, it becomes obvious why they are such a great choice in terms of if you're going to study something about the environment to glean information about things that are more difficult to study, why seabirds have been um, kind of a favorite um, group to focus on. So whether you're in the wintering grounds or on the breeding grounds, um, there are many reasons why seabirds uh, tell you a lot about the state of the environment, the health of the environment. So here's some examples. So the first is that seabirds are very long lived. Um, many species can live a decade, but many others actually can live even longer. So two decades and more. And I will talk about thick bill uh, in a couple more minutes, uh, but uh, for example, thick bill can live definitely two decades and we have some very old birds as well. Um, one, again, I already mentioned the trade-offs. So they, they do live a long time and that's actually a good thing because oftentimes they don't lay that many eggs. And the level of parental care required to raise a chick is very, very high. So in species in particular that are, um, you know, they go to co their colonies or they go to land to breed, they might not need to go to land otherwise, but they might go onto an island to breed and lay their eggs, raise their chicks the food has to be brought back to the colony. So in the case of fish eating seabirds, the fish have to be, you know, uh, essentially uh, collected for the adults. The adults have to feed themselves too. And the chicks have to be fed. So they have to take turns in order to protect the chick from predators on land while the parent goes away. Uh, and then parent too then can take turns and also go feed itself, get, uh, and also again, bring fish back for the chick. So they have to take turns. This is really the only way it works. And um, as juveniles, there's still parental care involved. A lot of juveniles have to learn to fish. <laughs> this, this is not something they learn overnight and they are terrible at it initially. So oftentimes they have to be fed for some time after they leave the colony and they can fly for themselves. And then finally, some, uh, some uh, juveniles require many, many years to actually fully grow, mature and be able to reproduce. So there may be five years involved. And for some species, that may be double that amount of time. And that doesn't mean the first breeding attempt is successful as well. So we do have some record holders and feel free to mute yourself just for fun. Does anyone know who this bird is on the picture? No? Okay. <laughs> no takers? All right. Well, this bird is a uh, Lathan albatross by the name of Wisdom. Uh, so hopefully that name rings a bell for at least some of you. So Wisdom is a minimum of 70 years old. She's a Lathan albatross and oftentimes she's breeding on Midway Atoll in the middle of the, uh, the Pacific, sorry. And um, this is the, the minimum age. Uh, she was already um, kind of, you know, obviously when they banded her, she wasn't just, um, you know, hatched that year. So she's at least 70 years old and she is still a mom. <laughs> her last breeding attempt was December, 2021. Uh, albatrosses don't lay that many eggs. They might lay one egg and uh, they might skip years in between uh, laying eggs. And so, it may take seven to 10 years for an albatross to reach um, uh, the age of sexual maturity where it can actually begin to reproduce. Now, over her lifetime, Wisdom has produced at least 30 chicks successfully. How many survive today, we're not sure. Part of it is that we might not know where the chicks settle uh, afterwards as grownups, 
but uh, essentially at least one is breeding right now, uh, very close to her on Midway Atoll. So again, there may be many reasons, sorry, I don't know if you, uh, if this is covering up my screen a little bit, but basically, uh, so seabirds are just these really great environmental indicators and they're oftentimes thought of as the canaries in the coal mine. So many of them are top predators in terms of um, uh, the marine environment. Uh, so while many of them may scavenge, uh, things like that, uh, many of them are feeding uh, not only on invertebrates, but also fish that in turn may also be carnivorous. So it just depends, but essentially you can have this very complex food webs in the ocean. And um, what happens with the seabirds is if there's anything wrong in that food web, um, you might not detect it, but if you go study seabirds, you might notice that they're losing weight or that their breeding success is low or that mortality is high. And so these are indicators for you that there might be something wrong in the environment. And of course you have to then go and explore where that level is. Uh, in the case of contaminants, you'll, you'll hear a lot of um, teams who may collect, selectively collect a small subset of eggs over, you know, a, as part of a monitoring program. And they'll check for contaminants in the eggs because a lot of them are stored in lipids. And so when birds make their eggs, a lot of the contaminants will end up in the eggs, which is obviously very harmful for the egg and the chick. But it's just what happens. So that might give you a, a way to be less, um, less destructive in your sampling, but still be able to collect some data on what's going on with their health and the health of the environment. So we're learning a lot about the contaminant levels, uh, even things in the Arctic that are showing up in the Arctic, um, coming from other places uh, on the globe. And aside from what we already mentioned about why they're such great indicators, obviously they themselves are very interesting, but a lot of species are certainly in trouble and we want to learn more. We wanna use what we already know to make sure we make you know, the right decisions based on even things such as development and resource extraction. So I'll give you some great examples of what we have learned. Um, we have bird banding programs that are really well coordinated. Sometimes uh, markers are potentially provided per site uh, for age groups of particular cohorts, et cetera. Um, it just depends. Um, but essentially we have learned a lot about their movements, what habitats they need at what phase of their life, what part of the year, um, and so on and so forth. What they eat. Um, what our sex ratios are in the population, what our age structure is. Uh, so all these demographics, uh, all of these are really important in terms of uh, providing information to see how populations are doing over time. And of course, uh, there are places where we are aware that there is an overlap between the use uh, of, you know, by, by humans and, and the use by wildlife. Um, but we have learned too, that if we just offset our use at certain times of the year, for example, you can shut down a beach for six weeks of the year. And I know it's not always the, the most uh, <laughs> popular choice, but it means that both humans and the seabirds may be able to use those same, same beaches. Uh, we just have to be respectful at certain times of the year. So sometimes it takes just small actions that make a big difference for the seabirds. And so again, the more information we have, the better decision making we can, we, you know, we can take part of. Um, we can also get a lot of information about the predators themselves and pathogens in the population. Um, and I think for a lot of people too, seabirds are, are just really amazing. I mean, they're dinosaurs. <laughs> they're dinosaurs that have conquered land, uh, have excelled at it. So they've conquered the air, they've excelled at it, and they, they have also conquered the water and they excel at it. So here's some gannets. Uh, this is not my photo, by the way, but uh, here's some gannets and they're fishing and they're so streamlined. And so I know they've also inspired design, right? Aerodynamics. Um, but we have a lot, uh, a lot that we have to be thankful for in terms of what we have learned, including uh, regarding genetics and human genetics. So I won't get a chance to talk to you too much about that part of it, but I'll share a couple of examples with you. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you why it was such a great idea. <laughs> to undertake this very expensive studies in the Arctic. So um, the disclaimer to a lot of these studies um, is that th these are very expensive studies and uh, they are not easily done, requires a lot of coordination, uh, a lot of relationship building, building trust, 
Um, there are many levels of permits that one needs to go work in the Arctic. Uh, and uh, thankfully, things are better now. You have to consult with the elders who may be responsible for uh, making decisions for who is allowed to do what and where. And that information is shared. So you can write reports, you can provide presentations, uh, things like that, and you become co-owners of the data. So those are some really great things that we do, but uh, it, is, it is challenging planning it. And then of course, training to be uh, in the Arctic. So typically this is now Coates Island. Um, nobody lives on this island. Uh, there was an Inuit settlement um, that unfortunately died out uh, over a hundred years ago because of the disease. And nowadays, what you have is communities, Inuit communities will go, uh, who have, um, obviously, they, they, um, they are able to do this, they're allowed to do this. They can go on the island and hunt, collect berries, uh, maybe some fishing, things like that. And, uh, but typically, only a few researchers are on the island at any given time. Um, and uh, so here's just a shot of the island. I'll, I'll show you in a map in a minute. But essentially, you're looking at uh, where our camp is. So there are these little blue things, blue blue dots on top of this hill. Uh, that is our camp, our sleeping cabin, and our uh, place where we cook. Uh, the bird uh, colony. So this is one of two colonies on Coates Island. The other one's about two kilometers away. But the seabirds are breeding right on the cliff face. Um, and this is actually um, uh, a colony. It's about 30,000 breeding pairs. And again, uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, also as part of the Canadian Wildlife Service and all these other different teams have gone onto the island for again about 40 years uh, and still counting, oftentimes teaming up with researchers at universities and also internationally. So uh, really, really exciting work. So this is where we are. Uh, this is Hudson Bay and South Anton Island is a bigger island uh, here, um, but Coates Island is the one where the arrow is. So it's not a tiny island, it's actually quite large, um, but uh, that is where we are. So I had already kind of shown you this picture, but just if you look over the other side, this is essentially where we land. So it's very hard to land on granite. That is very uneven, very unsafe. Uh, the shorebird camp uh, that sometimes does some studies on the interior of the island do that, and it is a little terrifying. But um, just wanted to showcase the twin otter. The twin otter is the workhorse of the Arctic. And uh, we worked out uh, with um, Ken Bork um, Air Limited for many years. And you become very friendly with the pilots. They know you, they, you, trust, uh, you trust your life, <laughs> right? They, they take care of you. And the pilots, when they land on the island, have to use this little beach. And there is actually a little river uh, stream that cuts through it. And there are cliff faces on both sides. So when the pilots are landing, they actually practice a couple of times before actually touching the ground. <laughs> and then the, the bricks have to be slammed. Um, but that is what a twin otter can do. And so it's, it's actually kind of fun and scary at the same time. But you'll see twin otters a lot. And um, but you know, thinking about just research in the Arctic, just to give you an idea. So to refuel, you can't fly out of Iqaluit, go to Coates Island and go back. You have to actually stop at a third place and basically make a triangle so you run out of fuel, so you don't run out of fuel. And you're limited to 1500 pounds of, of both people and cargo. So you really have to plan <laughs> if you're gonna be there for two months. Uh, sorry, no Coke, no big heavy you know, litters of anything. Um, but um, anyway, you get a lot of dried goods that are just come in powder form. You kind of just add water. <laughs> and just for fun, again, uh, when you get on the island, so you've got to lug all your stuff up. So our team over years of trial and error has kind of rigged up some very handy little pulley systems. You got to get fit. You cannot show up to this island and be out of shape. So we typically train physically before you go. Um, we learn a little bit of climbing, uh, you know, basics and also firearm safety. And uh, there are a lot of polar bears. And so you have to just uh, be ready in case you have to scare one off. Um, you also have to get used to the 24 hour daylight. Uh, for me, this was actually very handy when I showed up to the island and I was gonna work on my birds. The female MERS incubate their eggs during uh, the night and the males do it during the day. So if you want to catch both sexes for your studies, uh, measure them, uh, take blood samples, et cetera, 
you got to go in the middle of the night and the middle of the day. So here you are, and at least I was very lucky that I could walk on the tundra with some light, in this case, also with the moon. <laughs> um, and some days were really cold. And so my friend and I uh, joked with Josiah. Josiah Nakulak uh, was one of, I'm going to call him a researcher. He was so good with the birds. He knew his uh, birds so well and the wildlife. And he helped us also. Um, he grew up on the land. And uh, so he had a lot of knowledge about how to scare birds off, bears off and detect them before, long before we even knew they were around. Uh, but we used to joke around with him that, oh, it's a parka kind of day, right? It's very cold today. He'll just kind of quietly put on his parka and smile and laugh and leave out the door. So, you know, you had to dress up that day. <laughs> but this was the Arctic summer, uh, most for the most part, and uh, really pleasant days, you know, just a little bit underneath freezing to about 15 degrees Celsius uh, on, on a lot of days. And uh, you do get the seasons. This is late August. Here's our field camp, uh, our little cabin. And you can see the autumn colors. And this is actually cloudberry. Uh, so you can actually eat those berries. Um, so I will tell you a little bit about sort of, again, working there and what it was like. And so my very first year in the Arctic was in 1996. That was my very first field season. And I think things were kind of normal. I'll show you some pictures in a minute and tell you more about the MERS. Um, but just to kind of really mention climate change, which um, it, you cannot ignore it when you work in a place like this, it is everywhere. And while none of us were making a plan to go and study climate change, it became part of our studies um, and also our everyday life. So here in 1997, um, the permafrost for the very first time, uh, as far as that field camp had been working there, kind of thawed the top layer. And so you ended up with cracks in the tundra. And we had a pond we used to use for drinking water. And in about two days flat, it just drained. And uh, the nearest uh, freshwater source was about a 40, 40, 45 minute hike. So it was a little, it was a little hairy, but you know, it was fine. It, it was fine. Um, we didn't have any more snow to melt uh, for drinking water. So and we used to bathe uh, using the salt water of the Arctic Ocean, but that water was very cold. Uh, so here we would actually come and get drinking water. And we took turns again, and we eventually got a mountain bike and eventually an ATV to help us with the job because that was really hard. And um, of course, very quickly, you learn that you're going to always look over your shoulder and you're going to respect what's there and not, you don't want to be scared of it, but you always want to have a plan in your pocket. <laughs> so um, these were bears that were actually very healthy. You can see how chubby this bear is. There were actually three bears that came to the beach right underneath our camp. And they were, we always kept an eye on them, but they were fine. There was actually a walrus that had died. And so the carcass was there and he fed three bears for a couple of weeks at least. So that was amazing. It was an amazing opportunity to see wildlife when we were less at risk, but you never know. And sure enough, every year I worked at the Arctic camp, uh, we had uh, issues with bears where they always had to be scared off. And in other cases, we did have a couple of bear attacks. So that was uh, kind of terrifying. But again, there, there are times where you can just sit back, relax, and enjoy the wildlife. And um, it is beautiful. It's amazing. So here are thick bellomers, and here is one of our breeding ledges. This is plot Q, and this is during the middle of um, kind of the breeding season, late June, uh, late July, sorry, early August. And you might just hear <laughs> a lot of calls. So the birds call day and night to each other. They have very strong with the partners. You might hear some ticks. So the chicks create this ledge typically around August, and they give a very specific call to dad. So the, the father and so the male and the chick will actually fly out of the colony together, but it's more like a glide. The chicks cannot fly at that at that stage. They can only glide down to the water. Uh, but they will have the plumage, uh, uh, waterproofing, uh, so they are ready to then go out at sea because, again, their uh, Arctic breeding season is so short. But uh, so, yeah, birds recognize each other and uh, they certainly know each other's uh, partners, neighbors, chicks, and even neighbors' chicks. And I'll come back to that in a minute. <laughs> 
So there's the colony. Um, I already mentioned it's about 30,000 breeding pairs. And, um, and the colony, we, uh, we learned that it's about maybe 2,000 years old um, because of peat deposits. Uh, this is part of a different study. But so at least 2,000 years of mer generations have been coming back to breed year after year to this colony. And when they're done, um, you'll start to get sea ice. And um, eventually, the birds typically have to go find places where there's not a lot of sea ice uh, so that they can feed. And obviously, they need to be foraging also. And uh, But you'll find a lot of wildlife uh, start going a little bit south or places where there are pollinias, such as this place here. So this is an open water uh, space in the sea ice. And a lot of uh, marine mammals and seabirds will, will basically spend time near these pollinias. Uh, so they can feed themselves in the winter. So this is a picture from 1996. Uh, sorry, Oops, sorry about that. Um, so this is a picture from 1996 and uh, you can see the sea ice. This is in June. Uh, the birds are here are incubating their eggs. They don't make a nest. They just come in and literally plop the egg, the single egg on the rock, on the bare rock. And uh, the partners will take turns again, uh, incubating that egg and they are so careful. One of them comes in, they very carefully position themselves so that that egg doesn't roll. And the eggs are very conical and that, that shape definitely helps them stay on the cliff. Um, this is roughly what they look like. Um, you'll see some of the birds that have marker on them. That was me as I was banding the birds. Sometimes I was trying to get the partner so I could um, do some of my studies. And they get Sharpie, and the Sharpie comes off in a couple of days in the ocean. <laughs> so that's what that is. So I already mentioned that, that the chicks will actually eventually fledge, and they will leave with dad. So mom and dad will take turns incubating and feeding the chick. But once it's ready to physically fly out for the last time, uh, they usually leave with the dad. And our monitoring is kind of a, <laughs> you have to get used to it first. But we do try to reduce disturbance as much as we can. So we would check our nest sites every single day, but from a distance. So we had uh, some of these blinds made, uh, kind of held with hope and ropes <laughs> to the cliff face. Um, but essentially, we would use scopes, binoculars. Those are our main tools. And then uh, periodically, for example, every three days, I was going out to, for example, uh, weigh my chicks, uh, band any new chicks I had hatched. So you do that kind of um, at, at you know, various specific times of the, of the breeding season. And then our, our really uh, experienced veterans would actually repel right into uh, deeper parts of the colony. And uh, this was only done a couple of times during the season to reduce any disturbance, but it was very helpful, particularly if there were parts of the study plot so you could see these birds coming back when they were ready, uh, particularly the chicks, right? Uh, potentially five years later. So these are all long-term studies, as you can see. And again, a lot of the data we're collecting, this is why we have 40 years of amazing data of growth, mortality, and health status. And so this is where I think um, some of these signals of environmental change uh, became very visible. And again, thankfully, these were long-term studies. So I'm going to give you an example from diet studies. And uh, one thing, um, so thick bill mers are mainly fish eaters, uh, but they're very specific what fish they bring back. Typically, their favorite prey and for the chicks is Arctic cod. Uh, that is an absolute staple of their diet, but I'll tell you a story about that shortly. Um, another very common species is capelin. And right away, you can probably look at Arctic cod and capelin and see Arctic cod are these very chunky, very fatty fish. And the chicks grow amazingly well on Arctic cod. Uh, capelin is very important, um, but it's, you know, they, they just need more of it. Uh, and there are other fish such as sand lance, which are kind of long fishes. And a really important thing about seabirds is not, um, a lot of seabirds swallow their prey whole and they can't chew it. So parents have to be very careful what they bring back to the colony because the chicks might not be able to swallow it. And worse, sometimes uh, the chicks can choke on the wrong prey. So parents are, uh, experienced parents are very good about bringing back the right kind of fish for their chicks. Um, and they'll also feed on invertebrates, squid, uh, some, um, uh, and some things such as amphipods and things like that. They'll also use that. And I had mentioned the diving behavior. Uh, their wings for uh, the mer, um, mers have this very um, short wings for their size. They're basically at the limit of flight. 
And the reason is that their wings are very, very short and they serve a dual purpose. So in the air, they are fine. They can fly a hundred kilometers if needed uh, to forage. But underwater, it's a whole different thing and they are very good at this. So I will tell you a little bit about the tools that we use to get this information, but we now know that MERS can dive uh, more than 100 meters, uh, typically 50 to 100 meters, but they can dive even deeper. They can hold their breath more than a minute and uh, typically you know, maybe a minute, two minutes, uh, but the limit is probably about three minutes. So they can hold their breath and they're pursuit divers. So they will chase the fish underwater very much the way that penguins might. So um, based on uh, feeding watches that we do every year. Uh, so when I was uh, in the field, uh, our team was doing 24, 48 hour feeding watches and we took turns. So clearly you didn't sit there for 48 hours yourself. Uh, you would take uh, three to five hour shifts and watch every single delivery that came to the colony from your study plot. And um, we were able to document the size and the prey that were coming in. And this is, a, this is a real pattern and I will show you because here's a, again, something this is not only Coats Island, even though we detected this on Coats Island very early on. Um, when I was doing my master's work back in the mid nineties, um, Arctic cod was up to that point, the most prevalent fish prey and really important in their diet. And then something happened. And then after 1998, capelin became the predominant fish prey that they were bringing back. Um, this has not reversed. Uh, the data here ends in about 2011, which is the last year I was kind of helping out with this specific kinds of um, kind of project. But uh, the trend has continued today. So Arctic cod has never again been the predominant prey. Now, what happened with the chicks was that they were not growing well on capelin. So the Arctic cod was a preferred prey. The parents eventually learned that they had to bring more of it. So they began to basically work harder, uh, travel further, um, spend more time bringing back prey, which eventually the, 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 you know, the chicks, of course, uh, many of them are fledging successfully. So thankfully the parents learned to do that, but these are long lived seabirds. And so they might have been a cost to that. So we are still learning about what's going on, but uh, that is a trend that hasn't reversed itself. And just to let you know, this is um, a story that we hear from other parts of the world in other species as well. So the diets are changing for a lot of seabirds uh, here in Canada, in the US um, and uh, in other places as well. And other colonies affect Belmar as well. Now, you probably hear so much about this and don't wanna hear one more word of it, but I will just briefly mention, we are documenting um, changes in sea ice extent across the circumpolar Ar Arctic. So um, in, in terms of millions of square kilometers, there has been a decline just even since 1980. And many people don't realize that actually the sea ice itself is a habitat. So um, algae can grow um, you know, related here to the places where the ice is, the algae can grow. Uh, this is basically photosynthesis. And then there are also microbes and invertebrates that use the ice matrix and the brine inside the ice or just underneath in places and the pockets. And so this is actually a habitat. And both because they're present and abundant, but also when they die, this creates nutrients. And so this, uh, these nutrients are really tied to the sea ice itself. And then uh, many species need the sea ice, for example, polar bears need the sea ice to hunt. They feed primarily on seals when they can. Um, they really need the blubber and this is what they survive on. Uh, you can't feed polar bears very easily on, on seabird eggs. Uh, it is not, it's not enough. Um, so a lot of these habitats are getting lost. And of course, a lot of species need them to rest and even just kind of haul out like walruses do. So the loss of this habitat is, uh, is one, of the, one of the stories behind why some of these fish prey may be changing, not just the warmer water, et cetera, but the physical change in the, in the habitat itself, the structure of the habitat. These are also fish nurseries, uh, the sea ice. So that is part of the story. In terms of how we know where birds are going, again, these are team efforts. I was literally just an assistant for this. It was really neat. Um, they were, were putting a lot of gadgets on the birds, especially birds that we knew. They were used to us. They were part of our long-term studies. They were banded. 
Um, but some of these devices provide a lot of really good information. So one of these is uh, this large GPS device. It's, uh, it has a waterproofing case uh, because of course the birds are going underwater. And uh, we got this really great data from it. Uh, so Tony Gaston and other collaborators uh, with the data we were helping collect uh, provided some of these summary maps. And uh, we were able to tell that Coats Island birds were actually doing fairly well compared to other islands. So some of the MERS on other islands are doing terrible and traveling huge distances to forage. Well, Coast Island birds were going about seven to 50 kilometers around trips for foraging, lasting three to 17 hours. And this, my friends, is hopefully why it becomes so evident that you need two parents to raise a seabird chick. <laughs> um, so anyway, it was really interesting data to actually get, you know, to actually get the numbers. And you can do this year round. We have other special, small, very lightweight devices where you could basically put them on the bands of the birds and they would collect data for you. In this case, this is a time depth recorder. And we were able to obtain data, how deep the birds were diving, how long they were staying underwater, et cetera, at different times of the year. So when they're uh, chick rearing, they are working hard. They are finding anything they can and sometimes diving as deep as 120 meters. Other times it's just a bit more shallow uh, and other times when they're migrating, going um, elsewhere and for the winter, sometimes they're diving 140 meters on average. So it just depends. But all of this information helped us again, just kind of note how hard the birds have to work, but what is their health like? Is this normal? Is this not normal? Are the birds stressed? And over the years, there have been many researchers conducting um, also hormone analysis, looking at stress hormones and uh, um, just, just the body condition of the birds. And again, when we were able to get blood samples, many of us will team up. And, um, uh, and I, again, for me, I also collect the blood samples for, gen for genetic studies. So I'll tell you a little bit more about what we learned in terms of genetic studies. So this is kind of a summary graph and I'm sorry, it's a little busy, but uh, let me just start from the beginning. So um, this is the colony, as you remember, with Fox Gully, which is that little landscape feature. This is only about 200 meters. Again, the birds don't stay here year round. They leave the island and go elsewhere, and then they come back every year to breed. But over many generations, we know that uh, MERS show natal site fidelity. And what that means is where they hatched, the colony where they hatched, as well as the ledge where they may have hatched, is oftentimes the place they will return to breed once they're ready four or five years later. So that's what's kind of neat about seabirds. Um, they oftentimes come back to where they, they hatched. Uh, not always, but in terms of MERS, this is a pattern. We know this from banded studies. So when I did this genetic study, um, we actually find these genetic clusters right here on the ledges. So the colors of this little pie graph, so here's a, a diagram of the colony just from the picture here. There's Fox Gully in the middle. And you'll see this little pie graph with different colors. And that is a proportion of different genetic variants of a marker I was using. In this case, it was mitochondrial DNA. But I think some of this might, might be kind of obvious. So some of these pie charts uh, show that there's some genetic variants that are only found on certain parts of the colony. Remember, this is only 200 meters. These birds are flying around. <laughs> there's nothing stopping them from moving around. But their settlement on the, on the colony and where they come back, they're, they're coming back to lay their eggs is not random. So over generations of MERS coming back year after year, their offspring, their grand offspring, their cousins, you have genetic clusters within the colony. So that was actually pretty neat and um, I think pretty exciting. Now, there was a, a similar study uh, done in Norway with a small colony um, by Vicky Friesen and some of her collaborators, uh, which inspired this study, this larger study. So this, is, this seems to be something that may be present in more colonies. And even with morphology, this is the same map, but I'm just overlaying here just a quick note about morphology. Um, it was really interesting. So within ledges that consisted of say 30 birds, um, there were pairs of ledges that were maybe separated by seven, 10 meters, 15 meters at the most. They were different. So the birds within ledges were more similar to each other than across ledges, uh, even within the same study plot. Uh, so that, that was kind of neat. And we definitely saw this in this part of the colony. So what I call the S ledges and the JB ledges. 
So these birds were all different from each other, more similar to each other within the ledge, but different, uh, even 10 minute, meters apart. So that was kind of neat. And again, it sort of um, uh, told part of that story uh, with the genetic clusters over here. And there are analysis you can run to kind of uh, combine your data and look at the bigger picture. And this was basically the same story. Uh, so JB birds, so basically the east versus the west side of the colony, uh, but also these birds on the far part of the colony, behaviorally, they're also different. Uh, so the birds at the extreme end of the colony at the time of the study had been arriving to breed about a week later, and they were smaller. Um, they were not necessarily young birds uh, because we were banding these birds. They were not necessarily younger, the youngest birds or anything like that. Um, so it was just interesting. Um, so again, you have these generations and generations of essentially uh, family groups. And I, again, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how it looks on your screen. I think the very top title is cut off here uh, or at least blocked. But um, just wanted to mention that um, you can look at something called genetic relatedness, which is just an index. Uh, it's a statistic you can calculate. And to give you an idea, for example, siblings, full siblings or parent offspring would, would share about uh, an index of about 0.5 relatedness. And cousin to cousin relation, relatedness is about 0.125. So we definitely detected uh, this family groups on at least some of the ledges. Uh, so if you were to sample your 30 birds, uh, half female, half male, uh, some of these ledges had relatedness averages uh, that were basically to the level of cousin to cousin. Uh, not all the ledges were like that. Uh, sometimes I guess we could have had some new breeders or birds from elsewhere kind of exploring where they want to nest, um, but certainly a lot of ledges had the skin groups. And again, this is the, the bigger picture is why you send the previous slide across the colony, you actually have this genetic cluster. So this is what you get. Now, in the case of MERS, just want to tell you a very quick story about this. Uh, it's pretty exciting. Um, so the MERS are, um, they, they show helping behavior. They help defend each other's chicks on those ledges. Uh, they can even potentially brood them or even adopt chicks that get orphaned. They don't, they're not always successful, but they can be. Um, and the other thing that happens is again, there's group defense, but the birds recognize each other. They know, they know who they are. And if a stranger bird were to land on that ledge, it gets pecked away pretty quickly. <laughs> So you, you do have some advantages to having king groups. And if a fox or a, um, a, a gull appears on the ledges, they will actually um, uh, kind of pool their efforts to scare off the predators. So again, fam having family that you know, uh, it's actually a very handy thing here in this place in the Arctic. So then um, just a couple of quick stories about other things we saw. So I mentioned the polar bears and uh, I can't stress this enough how much the Arctic um, has been changing. So in 2010, uh, for the very first time, we got some really bad scares on the cliffs. So bears started to come down uh, into the cliffs. They used to sometimes depredate eggs and birds that were at the very bottom of the colony, very close to the water. Um, and occasionally the periphery at the very, very top of the colony, but we actually found ourselves face to face with bears in, in the colony, uh, which was very disturbing. Um, the last year I was there was 2010, but in 2011, the team actually had to pull out completely in the middle of the season because the bears uh, were everywhere and uh, they did a lot of damage. Uh, they may have actually eaten about a third of the colony, chicks and eggs. And they definitely obviously killed a lot of adults as well. Um, so the bears are coming onto land earlier because the sea ice is melting, so they can't hunt. And they're coming onto land in very bad, um, very poor body condition, very hungry. And so they are literally very desperate and taking very great risks because polar bears do not be full. They are incredibly agile and very good climbers. But to see them in some of the places we had them was uh, really eye-opening. Um, so this is happening. Um, and um, obviously we have to, again, just be careful. Uh, things get a little bit unnerving out there. And I think when you're a researcher, it's just good to be prepared and to always work as a team and just be respectful. And we are the ones in their habitat. So um, it's really good to just always keep that in mind and figure out things we can do to just stay safe and to not, um, you know, not attract them, not give them a reason to come to our camps. And that's sometimes a little hard, especially working near the bird cliffs, because that's why they're there. Uh, we just happen to be in the way. 
Um, here's a, here's a, a, one of my studies uh, sites. Uh, this is a picture from 1996 and 1997. And so I used to sit on this on this uh, grassy spot on the rocks on the cliff, and we used to then ban the birds. And uh, by 2010, uh, I returned to the Arctic, and my um, my study plot had been taken over by glaucous winged gulls. Now these are a very well known predator of of merch, probably the biggest predator of merch chicks and eggs. Um, what happened, I noticed, was that there were many, many more pairs, almost triple the number of nests in the colony uh, compared to the 1990s. And we started noticing that too. So again, for whatever reason, other prey weren't available. And so the birds were beginning to nest near, uh, in this case, the mer. So that's almost like the only prey they were really exploiting. So what happened to the other prey, we're not sure. Um, but these are potentially reasons why the, the balance is a little bit upset. And when the bears came in 2011, again, I wasn't there that season, but actually the bears ate most of the gull chicks too. So very few chicks survived. So that was also very eye-opening. How quickly things are changing. And this is a story I did want to highlight uh, for you, just food for thought. It was mind boggling. Um, I saw this in the 90s. We started to document it. Uh, we were watching. So let me back up a little bit. Uh, mosquitoes in the Arctic are not a joke, even though we all joke about it. Um, it is the most unpleasant experience you can possibly imagine. There are no mosquitoes like them until you go to the Arctic. There's no place on Earth like it. So. Um, they got really bad. And what we started seeing is some of the birds abandoning their eggs and chicks and not returning ever again to the colony. They were so bad. A lot of birds died, uh, oftentimes incubating their eggs. And uh, we learned, um, this was actually a study I published with Tony and other, uh, and other members after a few years of collecting data on this, but dehydration was one reason the birds were dying, overheating. So the birds that had nests uh, where the sun would hit the cliff face all day long. Some of the birds were overheating and uh, they're black birds. Uh, they're not used to heat, even a few degrees is too hot. Um, they were doing a bit better when they were in the partial shade as the, as the sun was moving. So uh, we were learning a lot about the changes, very subtle changes had big impact. Um, so again, now we know this is potentially a reason why some birds are dying. Um, other things we witnessed, so in 2011, the tundra caught on fire. Uh, we had never seen that before. We don't know if it was lightning. We don't know what happened, but the tundra was on fire. Um, so that was crazy, crazy to see it. Other things we were seeing is that while unusual storms may happen, it is the Arctic after all, they are strong winds, um, you know, I think weather happens. Uh, we started noticing some very unusually strong storms uh, that had so much energy. So they would come in, uh, bring in this humongous winds, uh, very high waves, uh, very destructive waves, I should say, and the precipitation would last for several days to the point that the ledges were flooding and the chicks that were too young and still didn't have the waterproofing uh, plumage yet, the waterproof plumage yet, uh, were wet and they would just die from cold. Uh, no matter what the parents did, they couldn't, they couldn't help their chicks. Um, we saw drownings, we saw injuries. It was uh, really something else. And um, on two of the years, 1998 and 2010, we actually lost entire study plots. Uh, the ones kind of where the waves were, were lost completely. And the one in 2010, I, I was actually wondering if we lost maybe just that entire bottom part of the colony. I don't know what the final number was, but it was it was bad, and I stopped counting because um, you know I, I I at one point it was my turn to leave out of the camp. So um, so we had a lot of carcasses, and I don't I'm not going to depress everybody by showing you lots of pictures, but it was just unbelievable. I'd never imagined anything like it, and uh, I was very depressed. And I convinced my colleagues to go down to the beach with me, and we did, and we turned it into a good thing. So we collected incredible numbers of samples, and we have used them for DNA analysis, stable isotopes to understand diet. Um, I can't tell you all the wonderful things that we have done with these samples uh, with many teams um, across Canada. So I want to say that thankfully nothing in nature is wasted either. A lot of things showed up to eat carcasses, and I was, I was very grateful for that because it was, it was just 
it was such a hard thing to to kind of see and i'm not going to talk about it anymore i promise i don't want to depress everybody but just to let you know that you know this is changing and think about the auk they also laid one egg and it didn't take much before they couldn't the population couldn't take all these different changes so um it's good to understand what's going on and again because we can adapt our conservation um uh, our conservation strategies and policy because there is a hunting uh, season for MERS, uh, particularly of um, the Atlantic coast. And some of those things can be adjusted if we have knowledge that the population is doing good some years or not so good in other years. So these are things we can do. This is under our control uh, to help the birds when things are not so great. And um, I did want to leave off with just a few uh, fun photos. So this is a pretty spectacular place. Uh, one feels honored and it is a privilege to be in a place like this. Uh, it's expensive, it's scary as hell. There's so many ways to don't, I hope my mom's not watching. <laughs> so many ways to hurt ourselves, kill ourselves. Um, but again, um, it's just unbelievable. It changes your life. It changes how you view the world. And uh, just, it's very cool. Other things are seem to be doing well. The Arctic foxes were doing well. They have kids every year. We saw caribou. Uh, we saw the occasional belugas with their calves coming through. Um, here we have some ptarmigans or rock ptarmigan with babies and they seem to be doing okay. So um, species are resilient. Um, we just have to help them out in some years, especially if, if there's any way we can help them. And I uh, just want to show you to some of the other species, the vegetation, just absolutely beautiful. Uh, these things are tough. Here's Arctic willow, and it's growing, just creeping on the ground. Um, you get these beautiful mats of wildflowers. The fireweed are beautiful. Uh, the cloudberry, I mentioned, the bears come to the island at certain times to eat cloudberry, um, as well as uh, communities. Communities will show up to, uh, to collect berries. So um, there are a lot of resources here, but it's also really beautiful. Um, but I did want to just get us thinking about seeds and propagules and fungal spores and things like that, because one thing that was uh, also a little surprising for me, again, I was there in the 90s and I returned in 2010, and in the 90s, nobody ever came to the island except the occasional family to do some hunting from Southampton Island. Well, in 2010, this was one of, uh, of various ships, large ships that had come to Coates Island in recent years. So in 2010, this Greenland um, um, a group of visitors showed up. So this was actually a cruise ship and it wasn't a humongous cruise ship, but it was a cruise ship. And they, they were very organized. They, they stayed on their path. They, there was a, a person in charge. There was a bear monitor. Um, they did everything that one would think they should do. They were very organized. But think about how many species we have introduced by accident, uh, including things like fungi. Uh, so think of our bats and West um, uh, white nose syndrome, right? So things can come on our clothing, on our shoes, uh, on our ships. Um, so we just wanna be very careful as we allow more and more people to visit this really amazing, remarkable places. I think it's good to educate others. I think it's good to have these opportunities, but to do it the right way. So hopefully um, hopefully we can get this right because um, it is a really special place. And I think it inspires people to really do more uh, here at home. Um, having said that, shipping is here the northwest northwest passage is open uh, partly because the sea ice is now open enough that some more shipping can come through so just know that people are thinking about this it's not all bad people are already thinking about this um i know there are um, many ships are um already crossing entire ocean basins and we have policies in place that we hope can be enforced in terms of the ballast water you know is it clean um, just preventing things from coming in your cargo on the hull of the ship, uh, things like that, because things can get established. So again, as long as we're really good at planning this and somehow being able to enforce it, um, this is a good start. Um, and while we're visitors there, uh, let's be cognizant that resources may already be limited. I know people talk about food security in the north, and that is part of it. Uh, but also water security. And I told you the very short story of our very minuscule existence on the island, not having fresh water. Well, this was serious. I don't know where caribou were getting water from, aside from going huge distances to drink as well. 
right? So um, that's something that people don't talk about as much, but water security in the north uh, and changing Arctic, it, it might be something that you'll start hearing a lot about in the news as well. But anyway, um, that's basically all I wanted to say. Uh, it is a beautiful place. I hope uh, you get a chance to visit in whatever shape and form that is. And uh, I think uh, we are doing a lot of really exciting things. Um, again, um, I think we have more dialogue now. Uh, we are uh, in a way more able to talk to each other, share stories with each other. Social media has been amazing. It's a, it's a game changer in the North for sure. Um, they're friends you can keep in touch with now. Uh, so we have all the right tools to stay in touch and to talk about ideas and treat each other as co-partners in research. We're not just there to go up and do research. We have to leave something behind. And uh, in turn, we have to learn how uh, not to make decisions in a vacuum. We have to have a dialogue. And it may be that you can collect some extra bits of data that are super important for a community. So those are things that we talk about now, I think, which is really exciting. And I think aside from our kind of a bit of a dark past that we've had, uh, we are starting kind of an exciting era and it is, it is really nice. Uh, and this includes an entire circumpolar approach to planning and just sharing stories and knowledge. So um, I'll leave you with that. And there's so much to talk about. Sorry, I went completely over time. Uh, I'm gonna be quiet now, but I just wanted to say thank you. And I appreciate there are many dialects in the Arctic and this is not the only word for thank you, but uh, that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, great. Thank you very much, Gabriella. That was uh, a really interesting presentation. And uh, um, I hope you can stay and answer some questions if anybody wants to ask. It'll be my pleasure. Uh, thank you for being so patient. I, again, I'm sorry I talked so long. I didn't. I didn't mean to do that to you on your that's, night that's evening. Quite a right. I think I want to come back as an albatross. So if they're over <laughs> seventy years old, you know what? You're not the first person to tell me that. It'd be, I think, a pretty amazing experience. Pretty nice views for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, is there any, like you, your last, you were up there in 2012, but is there continuing studies happening up there? Yes. So in terms of field work, I was there in the mid nineties and then I did a lot of work. I'm going to call myself an armchair biologist. So I was actually involved with a group of the Arctic Council and we were talking about science planning, monitoring programs, but I didn't get a chance to do field work until 2010. Uh, so I haven't gone back to Cold Island, and I'm going to be honest with you, a story that happened was um, 2011 was a brutal year for my team, and I wasn't there, but again, I, I, I actually baptized the camp as Camp Terror, kind of as a joke, but 2011 was, again, a game changer, and so they almost shut down the camp, partly because of funding, but also because of the danger. But uh, one of my colleagues actually, who um, is now actually working as a researcher there with graduate students, Kyle, um, um, Kyle Elliott actually took over some of the, um, the ability to fund the programs and at least continue some of the monitoring in collaboration with Environment and Climate Change Canada. So there are data being collected as we speak. And in fact, I was trying to find a video of the landing <laughs> <laughs> on the Twin Otter on the beach. I thought with social media, somebody's going to have something. I sure enough, I found that video. But what was really nice is to see that um, some students have continued to collect data, have their own research projects. Uh, there was a student who I think was an art student, got incredible footage and made it into a little video. So um, yes, uh, we are collecting a lot of data and analyzing data too, in terms of stuff that's been collected over the years, uh, even things we didn't think were that important at the time. Now we know, again, this is a long-term study and it's amazing. It's amazing to see some of the data from across decades. Excellent. Do you know if that population of MERS is uh, increasing or decreasing? That's the last question for me, Webb, by the way. <laughs> Oh, oh, no problem. Um, you know what? In recent years, it's been declining. Yeah. So the birds uh, became, you know, quite abundant. They were doing quite well for many years, and then the the fledgling success, the success of the chicks, wasn't so great for some time. 
But the birds live such a long time, the adults live such a long time that unless they themselves die off, you wouldn't notice necessarily what's happening to the population. But as some of those older birds are now dying off because of older age, um, you begin to see that the numbers are not what they used to be 20 years ago, 10 years ago. Um, and the foraging is a little bit tricky. We are beginning to see fish that don't belong there that we know the chicks would have potentially not been able to swallow at all, let alone get any of the normal nutrient levels they should. Right. Um, and Coates Island is doing okay. It's uh, not a humongous colony, but Diggs Island, which is very close, is basically between Coates Island and Quebec. Diggs Island has uh, 300,000, I mean, it's a huge colony. Those birds are traveling double the distances to forage and taking a very long time to come back. So obviously that's not great for the chicks. If they're working really hard to find food. So, um, so the colony of coats, um, it's, it's not doing terrible, but it's decreasing. But in terms of thick bill murs, uh, people are writing about them, how the populations are declining right. across the Arctic. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to see how, it, you know, um, people are encroaching everywhere and uh, the Arctic is no, <laughs> you think it was, you couldn't do it, but now with the cruise ships and everything, it, everybody is just, it, nature is getting trampled on way, way too much for my liking. But anyways, does anybody else have any questions? I think Graham has a question. Oh, yes. Thank you. I mean, I could ask you in the kitchen, but I'll ask you here in the group. <laughs> <laughs> I'd forgotten, Gabby, about the uh, allo parenting, um, where the, the 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 sort of joint defense against predators and um, the feeding of other uh, parents' chicks and so on. Do you think that's tied into this neat finding of having these genetic clusters? Is that you know? I think we used to call it kin selection. I think. Yes. Yes, uh, with studying evolution, that was uh, definitely a very exciting topic, helping behavior. And sometimes it's just altruistic. It's just, um, oh, let's do the nice thing. Animals can do it too. But I think, um, I do think that I actually had, uh, as a graduate student, I had some pilot experiments where I was uh, temporarily swapping chicks just to understand the recognition and things like that. Um, and it was a fact that parents and neighbors recognize the chicks that belong on certain ledges and some that don't. Now, some parents were, are willing to brood a chick. I mean, that's not energetically too expensive. You go one chick under your wing, put two under your wing, it's all good. Um, but I think when the birds were go going out to actually feed chicks that were not their own, that was very rare. But you can see how it might work itself out if the birds somehow know, recognize each other. Now. An interesting thing about MERS, which might not be common for other species, but species that lay a single egg in one season. So year after year, the parents may be producing chicks, right? Successfully, if they're experienced parents, and that can certainly happen. So they may have, um, so when chicks come back to breed to those ledges, they may encounter siblings, full siblings they have never met before in their life because they would have hatched in different years and gone out to sea. I don't know if they can recognize each other. I don't know if siblings can recognize each other across years. Probably not. I imagine not. I imagine they have to learn each other's call or something. But there's so much. The more we ask questions, the more questions we're left to answer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh... Rod, Rod, you've got a question. You're muted, Rod. Have you ever come across um, how the Vikings proceeded across from 800 to 1,000 and how they treated the birds? Thank you so much. And I do apologize. I realize we have this wonderful uh, messages on the chat box. And I was, I was looking at my screen here. You know, that's a really great question. And um, I don't know if, if, if Thor, Thor Heyerdahl got around to it. He's now deceased, um, but uh, he did a number of other trips uh, to other places around the world, uh, exploring this idea of civilization coming in contact long before we realized they had actually been in contact. And I don't know the answer to that, but I do find it interesting thinking about uh, 
the ice and a time where we would have had uh, expanded sea ice areas. And I know there's some um, ideas about how even before Vikings, perhaps people may have used the Ice Edge as a place where they were just walking, hunting, spending time, and potentially have come over from, say, Europe or other places. <clears throat> so, I don't, I don't fully know, but I find it fascinating. I do think it's, I do think it's possible. In fact, some of the earliest whalers we know about, I was surprised to learn they were Basque. So Basque, so the region between Spain and France, the Basque region, uh, they were incredible uh, ocean travelers and whalers. And uh, many people didn't know this until we start finding some of their ships in uh, the East Coast of Canada. So they were here long before anybody realized anybody was hunting whales uh, from Europe. So I saw this brilliant, uh, it was on PBS, so you can't really, I guess you'd have to make a donation or something, but it talked about how the ice, I, think, I don't know if it's these birds or but other birds, but the Vikings would harvest the down and put mm -hmm. straw to replace it and then use the down in there, you know, to stay warm. But they were very careful with the eggs and the birds. Oh my goodness, I did not know that. That is amazing. <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. Isn't that something? Well, I mean, yeah. I'd love to find where you could get a hold of that again. It was just really something, you know, 25 years, 20, as they made their way across. I, you know, I love, I love what you just mentioned. I was not aware of it. Um, I am aware that nowadays, I know um, indigenous peoples who have lived in the Arctic are very careful about harvesting sustainably. I know for eiders, uh, talking about down, uh, they may collect down and uh, it's done in a, in a way that is not going to affect the birds. It's done sustainably, oftentimes maybe from nests or nests that were finished and they can go and collect it. And I, just amazing stories. Thank you, I had not heard that about the Vikings. That is really mm -hmm. remarkable. Thank you for bringing that up. I, it's, it's, I'm super curious about it. <laughs> So we have a question from Zach. Zach, would you like to unmute and ask the question or would you like me to read it from the chat, the chat box? Oh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Hi, Zach. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> I love to talk, uh, Gabriella. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Yeah, I guess I just have a, a couple of questions. One question. We'll, we'll see. Um, so, yeah, I really like the the interesting, you know, you're looking at the cliff side and there was kind of this gully in the middle and I saw uh, you know, genetic structure between the two, two different halves or whatever. Uh, you mentioned you use mitochondrial DNA. Um, have you tried, uh, have, have, I don't know if, it, I haven't read the paper, but have you used any other molecular markers? And if so, have you found similar or different patterns or anything like that? Or do, do you know if that happened? Sorry. Yes, absolutely, yes. Um, so um, I'll just explain a little bit to the audience in case not everybody knows about our genetic markers. So a very common set of markers that we use in genetic studies, birds and people as well, we might be looking at things like uh, repeats in the DNA. So uh, we have uh, the sequences that, um, for example, you have a genetic sequence and then the repeat may be uh, the um, uh, nucleotides, for example, CA, CA, and the repeat over and over and over again. So those, mut those regions mutate very quickly. They don't necessarily code for anything, uh, but we use them a lot uh, when we're trying to, for example, study something at a fine scale. Uh, for example, if you're looking at parentage, uh, those are great markers to look at. So Zach, thank you for your question. Actually, I did. I had uh, used microsatellite markers as well, and I had a very interesting problem with the markers that I developed and uh, for a master's program and also used we found such high levels of diversity that this, the signal of the genetic structure almost was getting lost. So the pattern was there, but it was very subtle, partly because uh, there, there were so many genetic variants for every, every, uh, every marker that I had. I had something like 38 alleles for one locus, for example. Uh, for the audience, sorry, those are very, very high levels of genetic diversity. So um, I would have needed much larger sample size, I think, to kind of get at that signal. But there was definitely uh, a, a subtle signal there, too. And um, 
I mentioned uh, the kin groups by, by sex. And the reason was when I was doing my analysis, initially I didn't know the sex of the birds. Uh, very few of the birds, uh, I have been able to de determine the sex, gen um, and the sex uh, from the, the behavior of the birds. The birds look very similar in the field and you can't rely on measurements to sex the birds, but genetically you can sex the birds. And so when I came back to the lab, I genetically sexed the birds and I re-ran all my analysis and voila, this, this signal appeared. Um, so it looks like both sexes are forming this genetic clusters. Uh, it seems like the males, uh, it seems like the signal is stronger in the males. And I decided to cut out a couple of slides because I didn't want you to keep you guys till midnight. But um, we actually have data now from the long-term studies of the banded birds. When they first come back to breed the first time, five years later, we note where they settle on the colony. And uh, in the study of the subset of birds that we had enough data for, um, our colleagues continued that on. And they, I don't know if they actually published a paper in the end or not, uh, but my colleague Uli Steiner with Tony gathered all the data they could. And of the subset of birds they looked at, about 50% were coming back within 2.5 meters of the ledge where they hatched. And a lot of that was potentially driven by the males. And about 20% of the females go farther away whether they are not allowed to come back to the ledge because they get outcompeted or whether it's inbreeding avoidance somehow, we don't know. <laughs> but uh, that, thank you. So yes, there's a little bit of a signal from nuclear markers as well. Perfect. Okay, I think we're gonna have to call and end this. Um, I'd like to thank Gabriella again, and I'd like to thank everybody for coming to the speaker series and participating. And I'm not sure how we're gonna handle it in September where there'll be a hybrid, but we'll let everybody know. Our next speaker series will be in September, 2022. Uh, but everybody will be informed well in advance. Anybody I'd like to thank everybody again, and that's it. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for the invitation, and uh, much appreciated. I hope you have a great evening. Very nice meeting many of you. <laughs>